Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about what statistic statistics is. Uh, you have a two version. You have a version with the uppercase statistics, and then you, of course, have a version with the lowercase statistics, which I put in the title, as you can see here. Now, if, you, if you're talking about the uh, uppercase S statistic, that will be a science, a science about data. And uh, the different things you do with the data, you are collecting the data, you will organize the data, and, uh, of course, you are going to be presenting the data when you need to do that. Uh, and also, uh, in something we call inferential statistics, we also analyze the data, make some conclusions about the data, uh, draw inferences, and so on. So this is what we do with the data. Um, all of that, all of those things are done in some kind of organized way, in some scientific organized way, and that we call statistics. Now, statistics is about uh, probably the most important part of the mathematics. It's still a part of the math mathematics, even though sometimes in there are schools of statistics and Statistics is a part of business department in some schools and so on, but it is generally still considered to be a part of mathematics. One of the one of three mathematicians is actually a statistician, uh, so that's a very important field of mathematics. But when you're talking about statistics with lowercase s, like statistics with s lowercase statistics, then you're really talking about a plural. You're talking about the plural of word statistic. And statistic is a word very often used in a common language, but it actually means some particular value that is calculated, numerical value that is calculated out of the uh, presented sample. So you have uh, a group of numbers, and out of that group of numbers, you would probably be able to calculate something. Maybe the average, maybe the biggest number in there, maybe the middle value. Uh, or something a little more complicated, but that is called a statistic. So that means statistics uh, would be a plural of that word, all of the different things you can calculate out of this set of data. Uh, the data is collected. Uh, it's collected from something we call a population. I'm not talking about the population of living and breeding people. I'm talking about the population as a huge a uh, bag of numbers, lots of different things you might have. doesn't have to be necessarily a number. It could be something else, like maybe a color. Uh, but uh, in either case, it's, um, we are not considering population here. This is just a word we are using. We are not considering to be a population of living beings. Uh, so when you are dealing with a population, that is something that is usually very large. And so to have the uh, something uh, that you can handle rather than to deal with something that is so huge that you might have a problem to calculate anything out of that, uh, we are selecting something uh, uh, called a sample. Sample would be a much smaller subset of a population. So that is the, the set of... Uh, if a population is a set of numbers, then the sample would be also a set of numbers, much smaller set than a population, but it will be selected from a population. Uh, all of those numbers have something in common, which means that they, they carry a description. They, they, they have a meaning. That meaning we call in statistics a variable. So, for example, if I am collecting the, uh, the heights of... Um, 18-year-old males, then all of those numbers I would collect uh, would be a population if there would be nothing left to collect. Uh, that variable that is a common description for what I just said I'm collecting would be called uh, the height of an 18-year-old male. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I would probably collect a sample rather than a whole population. A population would, would have to have a description of what the population is, maybe all of the 18-year-old males in the United States. Now, obviously, I would not be able to do that. 
So I would collect usually something much smaller, and that would be a sample, right? It could be variable, could be something else. For example, uh, today I, we can we can talk about it. The number of cases per states on September fifth of COVID nineteen. So that would be a variable. So I would, in this particular case, I guess I would have all of the information. Maybe not depending. So I would have. Arizona. The Arizona would have today, if I take a look, uh, reported 835 new cases. So that's a number I have in my population. North Carolina, according to this, they have probably not yet completed this 256. Uh, so all of these numbers here that I see, this this number in yellow here, uh, would be my population, right? So again, the variable is a common description for all of them. So the variable is a number of new cases on September 5th, 2020 per state, right? Uh, could be something else, like I wrote here in this paper, uh, mileage per gallon. Mileage per gallon, uh, I might have to be a little more specific, mileage per gallon of a four-door sedan. So that could be a variable. Now, what would be a population? Well, uh, you could probably consider to be... Uh, all of the possible mileage per gallon of all of the vehicles that are on the road in the United States. And again, if I'm talking about a population that's probably not accessible to me, I would have to, if I want to collect some data, I would probably collect the data of certain number of cars, uh, mileage per gallon of maybe, I don't know, 300 cars, and that would be my sample. So I would have a 300 numbers, remember, I'm talking about numbers, not about cars. Numbers that are a mileage per gallon of a four-door sedan, each one of them. And that would I would collect that from a 200, let's say that way, 200 cars. That Those 200 numbers would be a sample. While the all of the population would be all of the numbers of all of the cars, all of the mileage per gallon, of so all of the cars that are currently on the road in the United States. So that would be much bigger number. I don't know what would that be, but it's definitely something in tens of millions, right? So, okay. Now, variable, that description, common description of a data we call a variable, uh, could be dependent or independent. It could be discrete or continuous. And uh, we are going to clarify this uh, terminology down the road. So I'm not going to tell you right now what the independent or dependent variable is, what a discrete or continuous variable is, but we will discuss that in our class. The every concrete value that I have is called an instance of that variable. So for example, in that sample that I just collected, I'm pretending I did, in that sample that I have, there might be 33. That will be 33 miles per gallon of one particular car that I have in my sample. That 33 is an instance of this variable. The variable is itself is a variable description. It's something uh, not concrete. It could be different things. So that variable, again, would be mileage per gallon of a four-door sedan. That's a variable. That's a description. Uh, an instance of that variable could be 33. Right. Okay. Now, when we are collecting a sample, again, so you have a population. Again, keep in mind the population is a set of numbers in general. It could be something else, but in general, it's a set of numbers. We are not really talking about anything living. Uh, so when you are collecting a sample, which is much smaller subset of that sub collection of that large collection we call a population, 
we can collect that in a couple of different ways. Okay. So I single out here four different ways that you will need to remember. One of the way of the simplest thing would be observation. So let me describe to you how would I collect the, the mileage per gallon of those cars by using observation. Observation immediately associate a person to uh, uh, are we are watching something like watching birds or something uh, in nature or things like that. N not really, not necessarily. Observation just basically means that I'm uh, having a particular process of collecting real data. So if I want to do this 200 uh, miles per gallons of 200 cars in my sample, I could, for example, go to Coma Commons, which has a large parking lot that serves the customers that go to the Walmart, Home Depot, and Kohl's department store. So that's a pretty good place that you can uh, um, find 200 cars. So I would. this is my observation. This is what I would do. I would go there. I would take a note. I have a Honda Accord. Maybe I take a picture of it because I might not remember what that is. But let's say I do know. So it's a Honda Accord LX. Looks like uh, 2005 to 2010 model. So if I know a lot about cars, I might know that. And so I'll just write it down. That's one car. And then a next car would be, I don't know, uh, Chevrolet Cavalier, some old car from 1990s. Okay, I'm going to write note about that. Maybe I take a picture. And then I go home. So I have a two, I have a 200 pictures and notes about 200 cars that I was looking at Walmart parking lot. And I go home, and now I need to find the mileage per gallon. So I would probably go on the government website, which is called fuelefficiency.gov. And there is a, a data about all sorts of cars from all sorts of uh, uh, years. And I could just simply go there. It would be a fairly uh, lengthy work, but I would eventually find all 200 of them, and I'll get the uh, 200 numbers. That would be my sample. That's what we call an observation. As you notice here, this involves a footwork. It involves a research. It involves taking a pictures of cars and so on. And none of that would be called observation in a common sense. But this this type of a, a collection of a data we call observation. What's the crucial here? I didn't do anything to the sample. I didn't make anything with those numbers. I'm just simply collecting them. I am not attempting to change them. Uh, so that's important thing. So I am like a third person independently collecting numbers. So that's a very important thing. Uh, the second way of collecting the data would be by experiment. Now, this is done very often, and you can probably hear that nowadays because people are doing this research for vaccine of uh, uh, COVID-19, and they're talking a lot about uh, effectiveness about vaccine and so on. This is, this is when you are collecting the uh, data by experiment. What does that mean? It means that you're actually going to have a, some impact on the data. When you are collecting the data, you are having some action yourself that might change the, the way the data is going to look. Right? So you're not just observing the data or collecting as an independent observer. You're collecting the data with some action. So how could that be? Well, for example, I might have uh, 2,000 individuals in which I am going to apply the vaccination and the another 2,000 individuals that I am going to give a placebo, which is called the uh, sugar uh, water in an injection. And neither of them would know that. And so now I would, I would later down the road compare um, these two groups. And what is the data I would like to collect? I would probably like to collect the data uh, how many days for each individual uh, was required to develop immune response. So 
For one individual, I might have 15. For another individual, I might have 27. For another individual, I might have Zippo. He never developed any response. For another individual, I might have uh, 20 and so on. I might also collect the second group of data, which is important for this placebo. Uh, um, how many days it took for them to get infected? And I might have some uh, lengthy amount of time that I would consider, maybe three months. So again, I would have for one individual, I might have uh, zero. He never got infected. That would probably happen in this group which actually received the real vaccine. vaccine. And then for another individual, I might have 120. It took four months and then he got infected with COVID. Uh, things like that. So now I would have a two sets of numbers. The first sets of number would be the numbers that I would collect for the first group uh, that I vaccinated. So they are immu immunized. Not necessarily all of them develop immune responses. Some of them might have uh, down the road uh, get infected. In the other group, I have this uh, group of people that I was not giving any uh, real drug. I was, they didn't know that. I'd give them an injection of sugar water or salt water, actually, rather than sugar water. It's sugar is a little bit of a problem to give to people uh, if they have diabetes, of course. Uh, so I would give them the salt water in an injection. They would not know whether it's a vaccine or a salt water. So they would uh, basically, uh, many of them would develop uh, infection down the road. So I would have a different, completely different set of numbers than this first group. So where am I here in this business of collecting the data? Well, I have a direct impact on the data. And the first group which received vaccination I gave them vaccine, which changed the, those numbers. Those numbers in the first group is going to be different in the second group. So if I'm collecting the data about how long it takes for them to get infected, in this first group, I have lots of zero. Nobody would get infected. Uh, well, in the second group, I have many numbers that are different than zero because a lot, you know, bunch of them would probably get down the road. In, if I'm doing that in six months or four months, they would... Uh, a lot of them would get infected. So um, that's what is called uh, collecting the data by experiments, which means that I have a direct impact on what kind of numbers I'm going to get. Now, I'm, I cannot predict them. I don't know what that's going to turn out to be. But because of my action, the numbers are different. Right? This is actually called in, in medical terminology and statistics, uh, biostatistics called a randomized com control sample, a randomized control experiment, excuse me, which means that I was probably choosing those people at random. If it, if it isn't, then it would not be called randomized. Uh, a controlled uh, experiment means uh, that, yeah, I basically have two groups, one that serves as an experimental group, the one that would get the vaccination, and the one that would not get the vaccination, that would be so-called controlled group. So you have experimental group, experimental sample, and control sample. What are you interested in? You're really interested not just in the numbers, you're interested in the difference between these two samples. So that's of some interest to you. And so also I could uh, uh, do uh, an experiment without having a control group. For example, uh, I can eject a mice. Uh, let's say I have, I don't know, uh, 50 mice in my lab, and I could inject each one of them with some chemical that is known to cause a cancer. Or somebody, I was doing some research before and concluded that that chemical might cause a cancer. And then I would be checking those mice over a period of time until they develop tumor, uh, <clears throat> a sign of a cancer, right? And I might measure something about it, maybe the size of a tumor, maybe the first instance of uh, uh, cancerogen growth, uh, in which case I'll probably, again, collect the number of the information would be how many days it took for them to develop the, the cancer. I might also uh, give them all the same dosage, so I don't make a difference there. Uh, so 
then I would have this data. I would. I don't have a control group. I don't have a bunch of mice there that are uh, given, I don't know, salty water or something like that. I just have the same group of mice that all of them had received this poisonous substance of a toxic substance, or should we say cancerogen, some substance, something that causes cancer. And I would collect the data, maybe the length of time necessary to develop tumor. Or the quantity of drugs that was given until they got tumor. I know it sounds merciless, but that's what the medical experiments are uh, on animals, of course. So, uh, so again, I have an experience here. I have a, what they call it clinical trial, but it's, it's not, uh, uh, I don't have a controlled clinical trial. So this is just a straightforward experiment without a control group. I have only one group, experimental group. And again, this is experiment because I am directly causing uh, something that I will get those numbers and they will be different than the numbers uh, if I didn't do anything, right? If I didn't do anything, barely anybody, probably none of those 50 mice would develop tumors. I would have nothing to report. But if I give them that drug uh, after a chemical substance, after a while, some of them would develop tumors. I would have some numbers to record, and that would be in my data. Again, for the rest of them, I would, I would have just zeros or something else that I uh, agree to symbolize to me that there was no any tumor development, right? Then we have a third way of collecting that is called simulation. Now, simulation is different from experiment and observation in a way that you actually don't have real data. So all of that I was talking moments ago, uh, the data that I collected was the data that was actually real. But in case of a simulation, uh, the, the data you are recording or the data you're collecting is not real. So you're using some particularly clever developer of the computer program or something else. Uh, that simulates the real situation, but it doesn't really present you with the real situation. And so now you're collecting the data from that virtual situation. So the data you're collecting is virtual. Now, how could that look like? Well, we can uh, play a war games that way, and the military often does it. Uh, so there are lots of different war games you could play. For example, one megaton nuclear attack. So obviously, for, for me to collect the data, I would be interested in number of casualties in an urban area, right? Let's be even more precise. Number of casualties in the New York City in case somebody drops one megaton nuclear device bomb in New York City. So for that, obviously, I'm not going to be able to collect the real data. Even if I would be able to collect the real data, I would be able to do it only once, right? So I would not get much of a sample. And uh, <clears throat> with simulation, I can attack New York City as many times as I like. So basically, uh, we need to develop some particular computer program that would take into account the climate condition, the density of the population, uh, the strength of the buildings in New York City, the dispersion of the buildings, all sorts of different things that we calculated in. And then we will blow up a bomb in there and see, uh, given the physical uh, relations of the, uh, of the uh, physical parameters of the bomb explosion, and um, with respect to the building, the topography of the New York City, of course, I forgot to say that, geography of New York City and many other things, right? So that had to be something really sophisticated to be done uh, uh, on a particular clever way. And then I might get those numbers. I might get, I might try to simulate that, let's say 200 times, and I get every time I get different casualties. Uh, how many people would die in my first simulation, how many in the second, how many in the third, and so on. That would be a sample. The data would be collected with a simulation. Again, the data you're collecting in a simulation is a data that is virtual. It's not the real data. And unlike experiment observation, in both cases, you're collecting the real data. In simulation, you're not collecting the real data. This is often done, especially in the case when the actual experiment in real format would not be possible or it would be illegal. 
or it would be too expensive. Then you simulate. Uh, the fourth way we collect the data, and this is what the, the government is currently doing, is by census. So they are collecting the data by census. Uh, if you have a um, census taker in your home, you probably have filled the form, uh, or uh, you might have filled the form and mail it, uh, which is uh, the data you are collecting on various different things. So it might be different variables. It's not just one thing. Uh, for example, one of the things they usually ask is, uh, what is your average commute to work if you work? So then you have that number. So average commute to work daily would be particular number. There was in my case was 12 miles, right? So that's my average commute to work is was uh, 12 miles. So somebody else would have something else and so on. What's the what's the difference between the census and all of that we, we said before? Census has this capacity of being something very close to the population. So if you need to collect the all of the the uh, distances to work from all of the people, you would be able to come pretty close uh, to that with the census. So census is when you are collecting the data that is almost as big, almost as uh, wide as a population. It's generally not possible to reach the whole population. Uh, you'll miss one or two, maybe more than that. But census is something that is very close to population. So the, uh, when, you, when you are dealing with something, you're collecting everything you possibly can collect, we call it a census. Uh, let me give you another example. So SAT scores, for example. There's this company, Educational Testing, in New Jersey, and they are doing the SAT tests. All of the SAT tests have a scores. All of those scores are in the database of this company. So this company is going to have all of those numbers, and therefore, if you want to reach that data, you would actually have an access to the whole population. And that is what we call census. So in this particular case, you would actually have everything. You will not miss anything. I don't think they can miss. Maybe they can happen that somehow uh, somebody was taking SAT and for some reason they did not record the score. But in general, this would be an example of a census. Again, all of those numbers that are there in the database, database are uh, the uh, part of your sample. They're, they're the numbers in your sample. So sample, again, is a set of numbers, maybe a set of calls, but it's a set uh, not of living beings, not of tests or anything like that. It's just a number, the score on that particular test for a particular individual. Every sample you collect has something we call a bias. Bias is the uh, defect of a sample. And uh, in general, you are uh, not going to be able to avoid the bias. So the bias is going to be there. Uh, it is uh, <clears throat> always there unless you have a census, which is are going to be all of the population. Okay, what do I mean by bias? I mean that sample, no matter how good it is, no matter how nicely it's chosen, will never be a complete representative of the population. You always miss something. So this population will have something, some difference from a sample, or sample will have some difference from a population. Now, remember, when you're collecting a sample, real information you're interested in is the information about the population. You're not collecting a sample so that you will get an information about, I don't know, 200 cars. No, you, what you wanna know is something about all of the cars, right? But you cannot collect information about all of the cars, so you can collect only certain limit, limited uh, number uh, of cars, information about certain limited number of cars, and I have chosen 200, for example. Now, <clears throat> you could immediately complain about it. So I was going in the Walmart parking lot. Now, what do we have in a Walmart parking lot? I mean, real rich people don't go to Walmart. They don't go to Cole. They don't go to Home Depot. Somebody else works for them. So 
I won't have too many luxury cars there. So you can say, well, that's what you miss. You, you sample bias. You really want to get information about all of the cars, but you're really not getting all of the cars. You're getting a particular segment of, of population of, of cars uh, that are cheaper. They're not luxury cars. Well, you could say another thing, for example. We are on Long Island. I mean, Coma Comox is on Long Island. The Long Island people drive SUV very often or sedans. They're not that often driving pickup trucks. If you go, for example, in upstate New York, a lot of people drive pickup trucks because they need it. So, uh, again, you could say, oh, well, you're, you're dealing with vehicles here and, you know, you have a different kind of vehicles here on you know, different geographical locations. So, we are interested in uh, miles per gallon of all of the possible vehicle energy in the state of New York, then uh, the Coma Coma is probably not the best place to go because this is a particular part of the New York in which this population is more dense. So they don't drive very large vehicles. And they might drive uh, SUVs, but then they definitely don't drive that much pickup tax. It's hard to park them. Uh, they spend a lot of gas in a, in a city traffic and a, in, a, in, in a slow traffic. And so they're not that much attractive. Uh, yeah, so again, sample has a bias. It's it has that bias is in a particular way. You can describe it. That bias, that defect that makes sample different from a population, makes sample that is not a representative of the population. No matter how nice you try, you could have that. And then, of course, you make a mistake. If you're estimating some other pop about the population and you have a sample that has a bias, that estimate is not going to be good. You're going to miss that, right? You, you heard that sometimes people poll political opinions of voters, and then voters say it this way, and then they make the poll, and you can see one poll from another poll is different, okay? Why could, how could that be? That there are polls about the same topic. Well, the story is basically that each one of them has a bias, and one of them has a bias one way, one of them has a bias another way, and they all differ because the population is not the sample, or the sample is not a population. So every sample taken out of the population will have certain defect. Again, defect means that the sample is different from a population. It is going to, not just it's smaller, it is not a representative of the population. It has a particular way that makes it special, even though you did not intend to have it that way. Sometimes people do intend to, and then, you know, they make bad statistics with the fake conclusions because they want to support a particular political opinion or something else. But in general, a serious researcher doesn't want to do that, but it just happens, okay? Now, also, when we are talking about the level of measurements, uh, the, the data you're collecting is of different qualities. So... Uh, the best thing you can get is so-called ratio level of measurement, but in general, you get something less than that. And uh, mm -hmm. there are four types that I'm just going to mention here. Uh, one of them is a nominal level of measurement, which means it's not quantitative. Uh, that data is often collected. Uh, it could be a color. I already mentioned that car color, for example. Uh, so when you collect the data about a particular car, you, you collect all sorts of different data. And of course, it's going to be one piece of data you're going to collect. It's going to be color. What color is that car? Uh, it could be a zip code, which is actually numerical, but it's not quantitative. It's kind of weird to say. Uh, it doesn't have a the, the zip code number itself is uh, a number that has nothing to do uh, in terms of a quantitative value with the geographical location. So we look at the geographical location, it says uh, 11, 7, or 6. Doesn't mean anything in regard to the geographical location. It's just simply a label, right? So you can you can see that on food also, they have the label, you know, the particular numbers associated with a particular product. Uh, <coughs> so those are <coughs> nominal. Um, uh, nomina, that kind of data is a, is a nomi, has a nominal level of measurement. It doesn't have quantitative value. Uh, gender, for example, also, right? When you are, when somebody collects the data about you, it's probably going to have one column of there, is, uh, there will be gender. So you're going to put, you know, whatever the choices. There might be nowadays more choices than two. But the uh, that kind of uh, 
the level of measurement. You, you're collecting the data, uh, but it has no quantity value. Like when you say male, it's a male. It's not a three or a five or 55. You know, you could say oh, it's 35 percent male and 65 percent alien or something. You can't have that, right? It's just uh, it has no any quantity value. It's just simply the uh, uh, description label. So when you have something that we call a nominal ordinal uh, level of measurement is for the data that you can order. That you can say that the, the quantity value is not uh, in terms of a size, but rather in terms of an order. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, very often you're going to run into customer satisfaction survey, and it's going to be uh, give us your opinion about the customers, uh, customer, uh, uh, about service in our, let's say, restaurant. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, and five. The general idea is that five is an excellent service. Four, and it might even have that in description. Very good service. Three is good service. Uh, two is satisfactory service. And one is you're not really happy with our service, unsatisfactory service, right? So those numbers doesn't mean anything. They only mean in terms of order. So you could as well call it A, B, C, D, and E. Now that would be nominal, right? Uh, but in alphabetic order, so <clears throat> they have some order. Or you could also write, I don't know, uh, 50, 40, 35, 20, and 10. That would confuse people who, who take that survey. What the heck may, you mean with the 34? What do I do have there? Is that a good or something, right? But basically what I'm saying here, that the numbers are chosen simply to be in a particular order. So the highest uh, satisfaction would be associated with the highest number. But the number itself, does not carry uh, uh, quantity value in terms of anything, any other sense other than uh, ordinal, in ordinal sense. There is an order there. There is something is bigger than the other uh, numbers, so therefore it's a better service. Uh, <clears throat> then most often you will have a data you're collecting that will have interval level of measurements. Interval level of measurements is probably something you're going to run into most often. Uh, that means you have a meaningful quantity value, uh, like uh, mileage per gallon of a vehicle. I'm not saying this is an uh, uh, interval level measurement, but you have uh, the number means something in terms of the uh, <clears throat> comparison with the other number. Uh, so when you say 33, that means 33 miles you can make on a gallon on average. So if another car has 27, uh, 27 miles per gallon, you can say this one is six, six miles more per gallon, right? So that means something. That interval of difference between 27 and 33 is a meaning to you. So if you have a 49, like you know, some electric vehicle, oh, that's a heck of a lot better mileage per gallon than 27, right? So that interval between 27 and 49 is much better than interval between 27 and 33. So that difference, the interval between the two numbers, has, is very meaningful to you. Okay. And the best thing you can have in terms of a level of measurement or the, uh, the highest level of measurement would be a ratio level of measurement. That means that you would even be able to compare the numbers by using a ratio. And this story about cars is exactly the case. So I can say, you know, if the car has a 48 miles per gallon and another car has 24 miles per gallon, I can divide that. So I could say this 24 miles per gallon is only 50% as good in terms of a fuel efficiency as this, uh, that has, this car that has 48 miles per gallon or vice versa. I could say the, the one that has a 48 miles per gallon is uh, twice uh, has a twice the fuel efficiency of the one that has 24 miles per gallon. Again, the story goes simply: I can divide these two numbers. I can divide 48 with 24, and the number I get when I divide these two numbers is two. That means it's double, right? Double better fuel efficiency. You have a ratio, or in the reverse. I was saying if you divide 24 with 48, you're going to get 0.5, as in 0.50 or 50%. 
So again, you have the ratio of two numbers. So uh, now you can ask, of course, question, how can you have now some two numbers that have internal uh, level of measurement and don't have ratio level of measurement? You can have that. Temperature. Now, if the temperature is 0 and temperature 20, you cannot divide 20 with 0. So you can't, you can't tell me 20 is that much better than 0. You just can't. You can say, well, it's 20 degrees higher than zero. Yeah, that's an interval level of measurement. It's a difference between two numbers. But you cannot divide them. So you don't have a ratio, right? Or negative temperature and positive temperature. You cannot divide it. Because if you divide negative number and positive number, you are going to get a negative number. What does that mean in terms of a ratio? That's a, oh, this one is negative 30% better. You don't have it. It doesn't have any meaning to you, right? So again... There are sometimes data you collect, like a temperature, for example, when you don't have a ratio between two numbers. Anytime you're collecting some data that will have a zero as a possibility, you will not have a ratio level of measurement in that data uh, because you cannot divide with zero. So again, if you have a data that you can divide every piece of data with any other piece of data, then you have a ratio level of me measurement. If you cannot divide, but you can actually see the difference in terms of interval, then you have interval level of measurement. If you don't have any quantitative meaning, but you can order them, you can say, oh, this one is better than this one, then you have an ordinal level of measurement. If you don't have numbers at all, then you have, or you have numbers that don't mean anything as numbers, like a zip code. If you have that, then you have a nominal level of measurement, right? Now, let me give you another uh, ratio level of measurement example. Income. A person could have an income, uh, annual income, for example, annual income of eighty thousand dollars. Another person could have an annual income of one hundred thousand dollars. You can divide that both ways. If you divide one hundred thousand with eighty thousand, the number you're going to get, you can use your calculator, is one point two. That means twenty percent higher. The guy with the uh, one, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> 1.25. I just made a mistake. Oh, I should divide it myself. Let me try to do that. So if I divide 100 with 80, I'm going to skip on those 1,000 because it's the same thing. 1.25. Yeah, I was right. 1.25. So 1.25, what does that mean? That means that the person has 100,000 annual income has a 25% higher income than this person has a 80,000, okay? Now, you can also do the reverse. If you divide 80,000 with 100,000, then you will get 0.8 or 0.80. So you can say that this person with lower income has income that is 80% of the income of the person with a higher income, okay? So this is the... Uh, I was able to divide each number with the another number. So I, 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 I was able to get the ratio between both numbers either way. That indicates that this data, the income, annual income per person, it has a ratio level of measurement, right? So again, uh, those are the four types that you can collect. What do you want? Well, you want what you can get. And, of course, if you can get the ratio level measurement the best, they give you the, the most information, then you try to collect that, right? <clears throat> so you're not, when you're collecting uh, information about the income of people, uh, like IRS does, they're not asking you, do you have a high income or you have low income or you have middle income? They don't ask you that. They ask you exactly how much you have. So they want to have the best quality of data they collect, right? They could say, you know, uh, give me in terms of one, two, three, what you have. One being uh, poor, two being average, three being rich uh, level of income. So you give one, two, three. That would be ordinary level of measurement. But the IRS is not going to do that. They're not interested in uh, lower level of measurement. They can get higher level of measurement. So they're going to ask you exactly how much you make. So that would be ratio level of measurement. Right. 
So, or you can say, well, I can have a zero. Uh, no, not really. Because if you are returning, having a tax return, if you have a zero income, you don't need to do the tax return, right? That is a law about it. So even if you have a certain level, you don't have to do tax return. So zero will never, will never pop up in an IRS return. Uh, unless somebody is naive, so, you know, it's feeling IRS return that uh, would have a zero. And they're not interested in those kind of income because they know that they can't get any taxes out of it. Uh, okay. So this is uh, about story about the level of uh, measurement of data. Now, I want to spend some time talking about the what kind of samples there are. Okay. <clears throat> so the samples, what kind of samples we have. Uh, okay. I have to make a distinction here. You got to remember that. Uh, you have a methodology to collect a sample and then you have eventual result, which is the sample. So those are two different things. Methodology that you're collecting sample is one thing, and this is what we're going to use for the name of the sample, methodology. And then you end up with a sample that is one particular sample that uh, could be a good sample, could be a bad sample, depending on, uh, we already said the main, main interest that we have is that sample uh, for that sample is to be a representative of the population. So if the sample is well representing, if popula population is represented well with that sample, then we say that's a good sample, right? If if we uh, if the sample is completely different in terms of uh, what you can calculate as a sample uh, in regard to population, then you're probably not even interested in. Uh, analyzing the sample at all. So when the sample has a significant bias, you're probably gonna, you, you're not gonna be happy with the sample, you're probably not gonna use it, okay? And so, uh, so end result of collecting a sample will be one sample and nothing you can do about it once you have it. You can either use it or not use it. But methodology itself is something you control. How are you going to collect the sample, right? So, uh, there are different types uh, of methodology we use. So first of all, all of our samples that we ever collect are going to be random. Why is that important? Well, if you are going to be choosing uh, points from the data points from the population, then you are really not interested in the population. If you are uh, cherry picking the stuff from the population, your end result will be something that most of the people are not going to be interested in, right? You're selecting something that you like to select. That is not a collecting a sample. That is basically just cherry picking, okay? So every single sample we are collecting that is of any kind of value in statistics will have to be random to a different extent, right? There's different kind of randomness. Uh, some famous person in the past has said that real random thing can only be done by a god. That human beings is just simply not capable of doing things at random. Even though we often say, oh, no, he was, you know, he was doing that at random. Uh, basically, that's almost impossible. Next to impossible. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it's next to impossible. Meaning that whenever you're doing something, there's always some kind of underlining idea which is going to induce some kind of bias, right? Uh, that you might not even expect. For example, you are interested in political opinion of people. If you're interested in political opinion, what are you going to do? You're going to use a telephone, right? You're not going to go from house to house. You're going to use a telephone. Uh, and if you use a telephone, you're going to be calling people, which means that you're going to be getting only the people that have phone accounts that are uh, available, right? The people that have phone, uh, phone numbers that are not listed anywhere are not going to be something that you're going to be able to talk to unless, uh, unless they are your friends who somehow had that number, uh, in which case, again, you're cherry picking. You're not really uh, doing that at random. So if you're 
looking through a phone book, you will only get a list of telephone numbers, okay? The in the phone book, you're not going to find any rich person there at all because they're all private telephone numbers. They're not going to use uh, public telephone numbers, okay, for whatever reason. Donald Trump, for example, doesn't have a public list of numbers. You're not going to find it, okay? Uh, the same, uh, the people that don't have homes, uh, homeless people I might have, they might have a phone, but they might have a probably, I don't know, some a temporary phone, they might not have anything at all. They certainly don't have a list of telephone number because for that they need to have an account uh, to be able to have that. So they're probably not going to be approved even if they try. So you're not going to reach them either. So basically what you're getting here, you're kind of trimming a sample from, you know, very rich people and very poor homeless people and you're not getting that. And then, of course, you also, when you make a telephone call, when you're going to call it? That's a good question. If you call it during the daytime, you're probably not going to find the people that are working. So all of a sudden, what you're going to end up with is the people that are unemployed, but they're not really poor and they're not really rich. And they're going to give you their political, uh, not necessarily unemployed, but not working, right? And they're going to give you their political opinion. Their political opinion could be skewed. I don't know how it's going to be skewed, but it's going to be skewed. It's not going to be representative of the population, right? So that's the methodology you use. You don't think about it. You, I'm, I was just simply calling and using telephone numbers that I found in the phone book. Okay, so here is the story. The simplest and the cheapest way of getting a sample would be by a matter of convenience. And I'm going to use an example now. Let's say you have 900 soldiers. Again, these are not numbers of people. 900 soldiers, and you want 300 out of these 900. Let's suppose you're in Afghanistan, and you are a colonel in a, some base. Over there. You need the 300 of them to make an escort to some convoy. All right? So what can you do? So now you need 300 out of 900. Your population is 900, and your sample would be 300. The simplest way you can do that, you're just going to get the volunteers. Okay, so now you are calling. I need uh, 300 volunteers. And people volunteer, and I'm just, as soon as I get to 300, I'm done. Now, if you don't get 300 volunteers, you have a problem. You're going to have to do something else. But if you do have 300 volunteers there, you're done. Not a hard work. This is what we call a convenience sample. This sample definitely has a bias. What's the bias in the sample? Well, you don't get any call cowards there. These cowards are not going to go into escort of a convoy in Afghanistan, right? If we have cowards, I don't know. Maybe you don't have any. But in either case, you know, the, the, your, your, your sample is biased against cowards. It doesn't contain any coward. So that's a bias, right? right? Every convenience random sample it is random because you you were not choosing. They were you know they were volunteering on their own. So it is a random sample, but it does have a significant bias. Okay, and you as a commander you can say, hey, I don't want to have the 300 the most courageous people on that uh, convoy, and I end up end up in the base with 600 people, then I might get attacked and I don't have anybody courageous left, right? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but, the, the, you know, it's it's one of those things you probably don't want. Okay? So what other choices you have? Uh, the best methodology for selecting a sample will yield something called simple under sample. And what's the methodology? Methodology, methodology is a lottery. So this methodology is perfect, which means it should yield the best representative of the population you can get. I'm not saying it will. When I'm saying methodology is perfect, the end result might not be. Uh, how can methodology be so perfect and the end result could be completely wrong? Well, take yourself, for example. Sometimes you say, I'm going to start at this much and that much and this much. I'm fully organized. I'm going to do the homeworks. I'm going to prepare myself for the test and so on. And the end result, you get D. Huh. So again, you have a great methodology where you, you did everything you needed to do, but the end result is not good in your view program. Okay? So I'm not saying this is what's going to happen, 
but this sometimes happens. However, you have the best chance of getting better sample than with any other methodology. So that lottery methodology is very simple. You will get the pieces of paper. You will write every single soldier on that. So you have 900 soldiers, right? You write every single soldier on a piece of a paper. You want to try to write it with something really light so you don't get pieces of paper different. <coughs> not by size, <coughs> not by the weight or anything. And you're going to put 900 pieces of paper like that in something when you can draw that around them. Let's say a huge hat or a huge box. <coughs> and you're going to draw one by one. That's a typical lottery situation. <coughs> you can maybe do some better idea for a lottery, but that's a uh, type of idea you can use for lottery. And once you end up <coughs> with 300 pieces of paper, you took out of that hat or a box, you have your sample. <coughs> Again, I am not saying that that sample is not go is going to be representative population. Maybe everybody in this 300 that you're going to get is going to be shorter than five feet. I don't know. It's, it can uh, maybe that, that cannot happen in military. Let's say I don't know anybody in that sample uh, sample is going to be taller than six feet, right? Which means somehow you ended up with a bad sample anyway. Methodology itself is perfect, but the end result is not necessarily perfect. Nevertheless, we call this simple random sample because of the methodology. Lottery methodology yields simple random sample. I can be even more precise about it. What a simple random sample has to be. Number one, every single soldier in your set of 900, every single piece of data from the population, I'm talking about here of human beings, but every single piece of data from the population has to have the same chance to be in the sample as any other, right? And you think about it, but that's the case here. Every single soldier has one out of three chance to be in your sample. You took 300 out of 900. Any one of them could, be, could have been one of those 300. There's no difference from one soldier to another, but that's not enough. More. Any two soldiers, consider, let's say, two brothers. Any two soldiers have to have the same chance of being in your sample as any other two soldiers. So any two soldiers, the same chance to be in the sample as any other two soldiers. Okay? That's important. This is not all. Any three soldiers have to have the same chance to be in your sample as any other three soldiers. And on you go. Any 299 soldiers, any 299, has to, they have to have the same chance as a group to be in your sample of 300 as any other 299. And finally, any 300. Select any 300 soldiers you, you want. They have to have the same chance of being in your sample as any other 300. If you can say that, that's, that's the case with this methodology, and it is. I'm not going to argue that, but it is the case. Then the end result we call simple random sample. Now, simple random sample is produced by a perfect methodology, lottery system, but it's not necessarily perfect. Again, the sample is one thing you have at the end. It's not necessarily going to be representative of the population. Again, you could end up with the, everybody in your sample has mustaches. Then you have like 400 people in mustaches and 500 people without. And somehow you ended up with 300, they have all of them. You know, if somebody's going to accuse you down the road, it's going to, you know, some media is going to report, this colonel does not like people with mustaches, and he selected 300 of them to go on this dangerous mission while he had other choices, right? So again, this, at the end result, your sample is not necessarily going to be perfect. Methodology is. Methodology is lottery. Okay. Then there is another kind of methodology you can use, which is very often used, stratified random sample. If you do the following, it's going to be stratified random sample. 
you're going to divide your population, your soldiers, your 900 soldiers, into groups. And you're going to take from each group proportionally. For example, you might have companies. The first company has 270 soldiers. The second company has company B has 270 soldiers. The company C has 360 soldiers. So those are your stratas. We call them stratas. Layer. One layer, another layer, another layer. In military, you don't call them layer. You just call them companies. So you have the one company, another company, another company. The strata, a layer. So out of the first company A that has 270 soldiers, you're going to select 90. Why? Because it's proportional. It's a third. You need a third out of the whole base. You have 900 soldiers, you need 300. That's a third. So out of the first company, you're selecting a third, 90 soldiers. The second company, company B, also has 270 soldiers. So you're going to also select 90. Like how are you going to do that? It's up to you. You might want to use a lottery for that. Okay? But this is not going to be simple random sample. It's just going to be that piece of random sample you selected was done by using lottery. But the rest of that was not done by using lottery because you were you, you were dividing. Right? The, the 300 soldiers in the company C have no chance of being in your eventual selection because you need to have 90 from company A, 90 from company B. Okay? And then how many are you going to take from company C? A third. A uh, third of 360 is 120. So you have 120 soldiers from company C, 90 from company B, 90 from company A. Total, you have 300. And the selection that, that you made uh, was probably done by lottery or something else. You have a stratified random sample. Why is this sample? Uh, why would you want to have this sample when you could just simply have a simple random sample? You could have this. You, you divided them in the companies and then you were doing lottery anyway. Why didn't you just do lottery right from the get-go? Because maybe you were interested in a particular situation. You were interested in getting companies equally depleted. You didn't want to have, you know, most of the soldiers from company A go on the mission. So now you have nothing left out of the company A. Maybe the company A is important for you. Maybe that's an anti-aircraft company and all of a sudden you're left with a very small number of people that can uh, man the anti-aircraft uh, stuff. So maybe you don't want that. Now, uh, company C sounds like 300 soldiers like supporting so supporting uh, companies. And, you know, they do all sorts of different tax things that is needed in the base. Uh, maybe you don't want to deplete that one either because then you, you send them all on the uh, convoy uh, escort now all of a sudden you don't have enough cooks or 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 I don't know uh, the people that do the administrative work and whatnot. So you have a problem again. So I'm saying here there might be a reason why you want to stratify uh, uh, some sample uh, population first. You first stratify the population and then you select out of those strata, out of those layers, out of the separate parts. You select proportionally because there might be a reason for it, right? In the in the political poll. Uh, instead of me going at random, collecting the people uh, from different states to get a presidential uh, poll, I might want to have a particular number of people from California, a particular number of people from New York, relative to the population size of those states, a particular number of people from Florida, a particular number of people from North Dakota, and so on. I don't want to have all of my sample, or most of my sample, be people from California. Because then I'm going to get political opinion of people from California rather than people from the United States. So I want to have it proportionally. So that uh, strata I would do, I would have divided the uh, my poll with respect to uh, the states. So I, would, I would use the layers, the stratas to be states, and then I would select, if I need, I don't know, 3,000 people in my poll, then I would get, uh, I don't know, 40, 400 people from California or 380 people from California because that's the relative to the size of the population. And uh, maybe 200 from uh, New York. That's, again, relative to the size of population and so on. So, again, sometimes it's done that way. Before you do any random choice, you first divide population in stratas. One very often thing you would definitely do is to divide it in the male and female, right? So we know that in the last election, we have 55% voters were female, 
45% waters were males or something like that. So that's what you want to have in your sample. You don't want to have a big, bigger difference than that because then you know that these people are, uh, you know, that's how the people vote by gender. So you want to have more female than male and you want to have in a particular, you know, uh, uh, relation because uh, this is how they vote. Right, so that is stratification. This is very often done to avoid the bias because at the end story, even if you use the simple random sample methodology, lottery methodology, you might end up with a bias that you don't want. You don't want to have many more men than females uh, or many more female than males because you know that there is a particular relation how they vote, so we want to keep that. And again, if you are dividing opinion uh, throughout the country, uh, presidential poll, you want that. You want to divide it at proportionally per states because that's how people vote. Uh, the state that has more voters are going to have more people voting and they're going to have also bigger number of elect electors at the, at the end story. Uh, the, the number of electors is also selected based on the size of the state. Okay. Uh, the third way... Uh, or the fourth way I should mention now, it's a systematic random sample. That's another way uh, to do the job. This is usually done by some kind of computer help or some kind of organization uh, in which is easier to do. The methodology itself is easier to select sample that way than it will be by way of lottery. Because lottery, you need a lot of work. You need to, you need to put those 900 soldiers in 900 pieces of paper, and then you have to draw out to the uh, big uh, hat or a box, 300 of them. That's going to take some time. Okay, what's a systematic random sample? The simplest idea you could probably have, you can say, oh, let's just have the, you know, alphabetic roll call. Sure, you, you almost certainly have that for some reason or another, for pay or something else. You have a role, some kind of role with all of those people. So you can just select out of that role. Now, you have to do it at random, remember? So one way of doing it at random, systematic random sample, is let me use a die. I'm going to roll a die. Die has a six sides, right? So if I end up with my die that is in one and two, I'm going to select the first guy on that row. If I end up with three and four, I'm going to select the second guy. If I end up with uh, five or six, I'm going to select the third guy. So, roll a die. Oh, four. Good. I'm selecting the second guy on my roll. Because my die says four, right? I said three or four will be the second guy. So, I'm selecting a second guy. What now? Well, every third next. Second guy, three more. Fifth guy. Three more, eight guy on that row, and on you go. Three more, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23rd guy, 26th guy, and on you go. And that way you got 300, right there, like that. So you only did a random selection of the first person. It's either number one, number two, or number three. And after that, every third one. So if I had... A, I'm rolling this die, and the die ended up with six, which could happen. Uh, what you end up there is third guy is your first selection. Because the first guy would be one or two, or the second guy would be three or four, and five or six. I got six on a die is the third guy. Some first person I'm selecting is the third guy. I didn't select the first guy. I didn't select the second guy. I'm selecting the third guy because I got a six on my die. Now, every third next. So the third guy, the sixth guy, the ninth guy, the twelfth guy, the fifteenth, just not three. And you're done. This is so simple. No hat, no counting, no drawing, nothing. Very simple. I'm just put a check mark on their names. This guy, this guy, this guy. I'm, I'm going down there. So I can say, well, that just looks like perfect to me. I see any bias here. Well, there is a bias. The bias is against alphabet. Okay? Every single person 
here has the equal chance to be as any other single person. But any three people don't have the same chance as being other three people. Let me give you an example. Number one, number two, number three on the roll. Chance of these three guys to show up in your sample is zero because you will select one of them, not the other two. Okay? The guy number three, the guy number six, and the guy number nine. That could show up in your sample. It's one out of three chance. If you get number three, then number six and number nine is going to be there because that's how you're selecting. You roll the die, you get five or six, number three is in. Now you have number six and number nine. Okay? So that's one out of three chance that these three guys are going to be there. Yet, there is a zero chance that the first three on the roll will be in the sample. They will not be selected. It's impossible. If you have on your die one or two, there will be the first guy on the roll. If you have three or four, it will be the second guy on the roll. If you have five or six, it will be the third guy on the roll. But either one of them exclude the other two. Okay? So you don't have simple random sample. Because any tree should have the same chance as any other tree. Now you can say, oh, this is not that meaningful. Well, think about brothers. If you have two brothers, they're most likely on your rope to be next to each other. Which means, in this particular case, there is no chance, because this is bias against alphabet. In this particular situation, there is no chance that these two guys are going to be selected. It's either going to be one or the other, but not both. Because once you, sell, once you select one of them, you go three places down the roll to select the next one. So the, the, the other brother is not going to be in the sample. Now you can say, oh, this is preferable. Maybe you can say, this is not good. Because these two guys are going to say, I don't want to go on a mission. I want my brother to go with me, right? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what is good, what is bad. But in either case, it has a bias. The bias is against alphabet. Maybe it's not meaningful bias, maybe you don't care about it, but it's that. So systematic random sample, even though it sounds so mechanical and so computerized and very simple, it isn't simple random sample methodology. So it sounds pretty good, but it's not what it is simple random sample. So lottery is above that. It's better in terms of randomness. Okay? By the way, Anytime you do something with a computer, you will never be able to get it random. Even when they call when they call it a random number generator on a computer, you have that. It's really not random. Because if you try it multiple times, you'll see you always get the same number as your first. The next one is going to be different, but the first one is always going to be the same. So there's something to do with timing. Computer is not capable of doing random stuff. Even very advanced algorithms to produce random things are not completely random. Again, so mechanical choices are not necessarily and almost certainly not simple random. Only lottery can do that. You can devise different ways to do lottery, but only lottery can do that. And lottery, of course, uh, is used for lottery purposes because there you cannot have a bias, right? Methodology is good. I'm going to say, oh, I got it, right? Yeah, you just got lucky. But nobody can complain they didn't have the same chance. Okay? The end result is going to be one person. It's not going to be you, maybe somebody else. Maybe you, and not that somebody else. Okay? We have one more. One more is called a cluster random sample. This is my last example, cluster random sample. Cluster random sample is when you divide a population in clusters. And then you select clusters at random. Now, this is different than stratification. In stratification, you divide a population in strata, in layers. But you're not selecting the whole layer. You're selecting proportionally at random from the layer. So remember, I had three companies. I had the 90 soldiers in company A. And I was selecting 90 out of 200 soldiers from company A. So I had 270 soldiers in company A. So I was selecting 90 out of those 270. Okay? I wasn't selecting the whole layer, the whole company. Okay? Cluster is different. Cluster random sample is you selecting 
clusters at random. That makes it much faster because you're not selecting soldier by soldier, you're just selecting the whole tank. Okay, how can you have that? Uh, well, in this particular case, we can pretend like we have, I don't know, uh, nine platoon, 100 each. That will be 900 total, right? Platoon, nine, 100 soldiers. This doesn't have to be in this particular case. I made it up because just I want to show you the, the concept. So I have the uh, nine platoon, 100 soldiers in each, and I just need to select three platoons. So I'm going to do that by way of lottery. So I have now, instead of having 900 drawing, I mean 900 pieces of paper and 300 drawings, I have only nine pieces of paper and three drawings. So platoon number one, two, three, four, and I put in the hat, pull one out, uh, platoon number four. They all go. Second, platoon number six, they all go. Next one, platoon number one, they all go. And I, there you have 300 soldiers. So you did a random selections of platoon not soldiers. You do have a significant bias here, right? The whole platoon goes there, and the whole platoon doesn't go there. So it's a... Uh, uh, and you cannot have soldiers, from, for example, from all nine platoons, because you're going to select only three. So there is a bias. Okay? But this is very often done. In particular, it's done for the political poll. Okay? So how is the political poll that? Well, I let's say I have the I want to collect the opinion about the Lee Zeldin, which is a, the guy that is a congressman from the first congressional district in Long Island. And I have only, you know, six students to work with. I mean, I, I have six workers. So I am going to take the, the, the whole eastern Long Island in that congressional district is divided into zip codes. So... I don't know, I might have 15 zip codes there. I forgot, maybe less. I'm going to select, so I have six workers, right? I'm going to select six zip codes at random. So somewhere I won't send anybody. So I'll select six zip codes out of 15. So I'm going to do the drawing. And uh, one of my workers is Mark. So I'm going to say, Mark, you're going to go to Riverhead. That's a zip code there. So you're going to collect, and you... Collect that at random, whatever you want to collect. Just bring me some polling data, okay? And then, I don't know, I have Jennifer there. Jennifer, Jennifer, you're going to go to the uh, Southampton. Go to Southampton with that zip code and collect some data, stuff like that. So that is done. So again, cluster random sample. You divide your population into clusters, and then at the random, you select certain number of clusters that is going to be good enough for you. That way, again, you have a bias. It is impossible that in your sample you would have an individual number or an individual from every single cluster, every single zip code. No. I'm only going to have a six. But it's meaningful to me because, of course, I have only six working. I can, you know, send Jennifer, you go to Riverhead, and then you go to Southampton, and then at the end you go to the Montauk. I can't do that because she's going to say, oh, I'm not working that much for that little money you gave me, right? So uh, that's a cluster sample. So again, the best thing you can have would be, I guess, simple random sample, lottery, if you can do it. Sometimes you don't want to have that way because the end result is, might not be agreeable to you. So you might want to stratify first. Stratify random sample is very often done. You might also do the cluster random sample because it's going to be convenient in terms of the, the, the amount of work you're doing. Or you can do it mechanically by doing systematic random sample. All of them are different. You're probably never going to do that by using convenience random sample. You could do that as well. Something that is really easy to do, like, oh, let's go to one of parking lot and collect the data there. That is possible. Again, that is almost certainly going to end up with a, a sample that is going to have a significant bias. Okay? So that's my story for the intro and the statistics. And I hope you're going to watch this. And I hope you're going to have... Uh, also, this lecture, I'm going to put it on a blackboard and uh, together with the video. So uh, you could also read it and think about it yourself. So the next time we meet, which is uh, our next class uh, after Labor Day, uh, we're going to be talking about this stuff. If you have any questions, if not, we're going to move on and we're going to do something else. Right. So uh, thank you for watching.